Welcome to Health Talk. Thank you for joining us at the studio audience and beyond. We're very happy today to have with us Dr. Mark Zare, a bariatric surgeon, and we're gonna talk about gastric sleeve and all you need to know. And Dr. Zare is board certified general surgery and he's fellowship trained in laparoscopic surgery and bariatric surgery. So Dr. Zare, gastric sleeve is the most commonly performed uh, weight loss surgery today and tell us a little bit about it and what is it that we need to know. Thank you, Gloria, for inviting me back on your show. Um, gastric sleeve is a type of bariatric uh, weight loss surgery. It's probably the most common, most popular one that we currently offer. Uh, the concept of bariatric weight loss surgery is to help people lose significant weight. Uh, we're talking about 80 to 100 pounds and be able to keep the weight off. That's, that's the, sort of the background. Um, there are many different procedures we've done over the years, uh, and uh, we have uh, now finally come up with a procedure that we're truly excited about. Um, we can offer it to patients with fairly high certainty that it's uh, safe, it's effective, and the weight loss can last with them. Um, we call it sleeve gastrectomy or gastric sleeve. It's not because we, as some people think, place some sort of a foreign sleeve inside your stomach or anything like that. Oh, um, draws your diagram. Yes, I want to see I this. I personally would have called it a banana gastrectomy because that's what it really looks like. So what we do in um, a gastric sleeve is if you take your normal stomach, it looks uh, like a big sack and it has a fairly large capacity, right? So the idea here is to reduce the capacity of the stomach by dividing it into two portions and removing the large portion. So what we do is we take the left side that you see on the screen and we separate that from the remainder, effectively re reducing the size of the um, stomach to about four and or four to five ounces. So and this part is removed. Yes. So the net result is that you have a stomach that really looks like a sleeve of a jacket or a banana, right? And that is what we leave behind for the patient. So that's the new stomach, the skinny banana like looking structure. Correct. So gastric sleeve um, is effective because of many reasons. What we do here is we reduce the size, size of the stomach and we use the left side, technically the right side of the anatomy, but you can see it on the left side of the screen, uh, because this portion of the, of the stomach, as opposed to the other opposite end, is uh, very thick and muscular and it doesn't quite expand easily. And it so won't flip it around. Won't, yes, so it, it, what we do is during the procedure we place strategic sutures to keep the sleeve in place so it doesn't move and it really becomes a very stable structure um, and um, it, it really limits uh, one's capacity for big meals. But that's just the starting point. What this operation also does is because we remove that 70 to 80 percent portion of the stomach, we actually change a lot of hormones that your digestive system normally makes. We are talking about hormones that influence your appetite, hormones that influence that sense of fullness and satiety, and uh, very importantly, hormones that contribute to a normal blood sugar and control of diabetes. Um, we have actually learned that this is really an um, incidental uh, benefit of these procedures. As we were designing a lot of these procedures and its the predecessors to the sleeve, the concept of influencing metabolism wasn't even in place. We learned through the years that by altering the anatomy and reducing size and, and so on, we actually end up uh, influencing diabetes and other conditions through hormonal pathways, and that's been a, a really uh, interesting now, some people, have we seen on television shows, you know, how to be the biggest weight loss person on television show win a prize. Now, some people have been obese or overweight for many years, and people have to understand that losing weight is very difficult. Everyone should know that. And 
once one attains a certain level of weight and hard to lose that weight, some people are still afraid to have surgery like this. Right. However, this has been shown to be safe, and it, you make f five little holes in your abdomen and one more for viewing. And so the little holes are probably half an inch. That's right. And so through that, um, they are able to remove this stomach, this part of the stomach, and remove that and take it out. And um, what does the patient then expect post-op? What? Correct. So as you correctly described, the procedures are done through five, four or five little holes, and these are called laparoscopic incisions, as opposed to the big incision that obviously has um, unwanted side effects of pain and uh, wound complications and so on. Because of those small incisions, patients can really expect to have a fairly predictable post-operative recovery of uh, about a one night in the hospital. We send uh, patients home typically the day after surgery in the afternoon. They can expect to have a recovery of about a one or two weeks, uh, during which time they easily come off uh, strong pain medications, transition to simple Tylenol. They are independent. They're walking. They're uh, going out, uh, spending time recovering, and uh, feeling like they're ready to get back to work, typically by, by one or two weeks. So the first two days, they eat clear liquids, like tea, bouillon, and then the third and fourth day, milk and yogurt? So, uh, yes. So we... There is some variation among surgeons as to how quickly or how slowly one advances patients' um, eating and diet uh, after surgery. And the bottom line is because we create a new stomach with um, a staple line that needs to heal, we take our time before we feed patients solid food. However, because the procedure was done through laparoscopic approach, it's really not a big stress on the body. So you can easily tolerate liquids the same day, literally as soon as you open your eyes, you're, you're able to drink. And so that's the diet or um, eating style of the first week. It's generally liquids of different consistencies and you then advance after one or two weeks to food that's processed and blenderized and then gradually you go on to eat softer foods and regular food. So it would be clear liquids, then thicker liquids like milk and yogurt, and then uh, processed mashed food like mashed potatoes or blenderized food? Well, or you just use two words that are kind of uh, no no words we don't like. Okay. One is processed and the other one is mashed potatoes. But I think your, your thinking is absolutely correct. You, by processing, I think you mean blenderizing. Right. And absolutely, that's the key to that phase is to chop the food and blenderize it so that it's um, pureed as opposed to um, actual particle, big, big uh, right. components. Um, potatoes, carbohydrates, sugars, those are the problem foods that, right. that contribute to weight gain to begin with. And for diabetics. So especially who are, diabetics. Who are seeking this. Correct. Yes. And so um, in our education, we teach patients that when they've had this procedure, their main focus after surgery should be proteins, vegetables, and only then if there's space, carbohydrates such as bread and mashed potatoes. So when you go through that uh, cycle, you realize that the foods that are the most important fill you up so quickly that there won't be much space for carbohydrates. And that right. becomes a new routine for many of our patients. So even contemplating this to get insurance pre-authorization, because insurance does cover it, but the pre-authorization is like typically six months, where you yes. see an internist, check in, and that you actually try to lose weight and diet Correct. conventionally yes. rather than this. Um, so yeah, we are lucky in this uh, in that um, most insurance carriers um, do cover the procedure. However, they don't make it easy for patients, and there is clearly a need to take one's time and make sure that the patient is an appropriate candidate. He or she understands all the details of the procedure and recovery and lifestyle that has to change. Um, and then during that period of evaluation, we um, 
we, we make use of the other providers such as dietitians, uh, mental health specialists sometimes, internal medicine, and some specialties. If patients have had heart problems, they, we send them to cardiologists and get a full evaluation of their heart. Um, the process can sometimes take up to six to eight months. Um, we try to be as efficient as we can. The whole idea is to support patients because they have been through a lifetime of excess weight. They don't like the idea of yet another nine months of weight. Um, and so we try to be as efficient as possible. We have several providers that we work with and so the network is in place for them. Lots of support elements and uh, once that's completed then we proceed. Now if let's say I'm diabetic and I've been uh, I'm pre-diabetic but suddenly the blood sugars keep spiking and my internist tells me um, and I'm a hundred pounds overweight so I've reached the BMI of 40 or 35 uh, which is the cutoff and I'm at risk of becoming a diabetic so then I have this procedure and then I have all my medications post-op so when do I see my internist to figure this out so um, really my insulin or whatever. Correct. Good question. And then that's a very common question I receive in my practice. You really, one has to see uh, one's physician before surgery so you have a plan in place. Many of our diabetic patients have several medications for diabetes. What is very uh, almost magical about the procedure is that sometimes even before the patient leaves the hospital, they see their blood sugar going down significantly. And that's because of the hormones have changed. Hormones such as GLP-1, which is an incretin, it helps insulin do a better job. It ha it cha the change is instantaneous. It's not related to weight loss. And so knowing that, you really have to anticipate and be ready for a diabetes of 10, 20 years to melt away and be gone within a few days. Of course, sometimes it takes longer and in many patients it takes up to six months. During the first one or two weeks, up to six weeks, it's crucial to keep an eye on the blood sugar, make sure that you're not over medicating, and as you taper off medications, you need the help of your physician to be able to tell you which one goes off first and, and so on. So this is done with close um, teamwork. Yes. So. So you see, if I am diabetic, pre-diabetic, and I have issues of being overweight for many years, I would have seen my internist before, obviously in the eight months before to do the dietary changes, and then I, we have a schedule as post-op when I see him, probably within the first week or so. Correct. Because, and I think that my own patient population, because I see many diabetic eye patients, they've maintained their weight loss and their diabetes becomes gone. I mean, significantly better or gone. So tell us a little bit about that. Yes, so the whole idea here is to influence one's weight, but at the same time improve the health portion. Um, specific to diabetes, we have done uh, some good studies prospectively evaluating diabetes and its resolution following the surgery and comparing it to, let's say, aggressive medical treatment. Um, one of the best studies done followed patients up to three years and they found that on average sleeve patients reduced their hemoglobin A1C which is the blood protein blood measure of how well your diabetes is controlled by two and a half points. They started at about eight and a half and they ended up at about six which is considered uh, a normal number. Uh, compared to patients who simply took medications, maybe increased their medications, and there was only less than half a point difference uh, at the end of that study for those patients. So there's a big difference in how effective this intervention is for diabetics compared to just being on insulin or oral medications for diabetes. You know, diabetes is a $57 billion year problem for Medicare and all the insurance uh, payers. Um, so also as a diabetic, s some do not know that this is available because sometimes many internists do not refer them to a bariatric surgeon. And maybe there are misconceptions that they don't know how safe it is or what the long-term gains. Tell us a little bit about why is it so safe because, you know, physiologically it's 
you know, the same. Correct. So that is really one of the um, um, best chapters in, in the history of surgery, modern surgery. If you look at what we've been able to achieve throughout the years with some big events that occurred in the last 100 years, you know, availability of blood transfusion or organ transplantation or heart bypass and all these big uh, events in surgery, probably the most recent big event was introduction of uh, minimally invasive and laparoscopic approach, which allowed us, allows us to perform these complex procedures through these, these very small incisions. That was a big leap forward. It occurred in, in the late 1980s, and since then, we have actually been able to improve the outcomes uh, by 10 to 20 fold, which is a huge number if you put it in the context of other interventions in medicine that might improve an outcome by 5 or 10 percent at best. So you take so you that. So you mean improving outcome in terms of maintaining weight loss? Well, no, not even that. That then goes back to the actual procedures and how effective they are. But oh, just you mean being able to undergo procedures without complications relating oh. to infections or bleeding and so on. Wound dehiscence. Exactly. And length of stay in the hospital. Uh, let's take the biggest complication, which is mortality, right? Um, as we know, any operation can be potentially associated with death. It used to be that in my training days in the late 90s, bariatric surgery as a whole was considered to be safe, but it had a mortality rate of about 2 to 3 percent. For many patients of excess weight who have diabetes, kidney issues, high blood pressure that's resistant, and so on, that was an acceptable number still, because otherwise they had um, a dim outcome by just um, you know, their status quo. Fast forward to 2018, our mortality rate is now less than 0.1 percent. That's a 30-fold. With this procedure? Correct. Wow. That's a 30-fold increase in, in our uh, ability to perform these procedures safely without uh, concerns about mortality. And by that, uh, we also have improved all the other outcomes that have come through the years with bleeding, infection, wound complications, and so on. So it's really a very safe intervention, equally at par with removal of the gallbladder that has a mortality rate of about 0.1 percent. So this is 0.1 0.1 percent. So it's the same as gallbladder? Same as gallbladder surgery. Which and if you excellent. look at how frequently then people who know about these, how frequently this operation is being offered, it's as frequent as people's appendix being removed in this country. Appendectomies occur in about 300,000 or so in every year, and that's about the number of bariatric procedures we, we do these, these, these days. So it's prevalent, it's safe, and then most importantly, it's done to improve health, health conditions that otherwise don't really have, a, um, in, in many cases, an effective medical option. Talking about diabetes, resistant diabetes, high blood pressure, and so on which in and of themselves, each one of them can then lead to other organ damage and organ failures. And so the, the, the spectrum of conditions that one can influence with an hour-long procedure all of a sudden is, uh, is quite unbelievable. And that's what we see every day in our practice. So there is a huge you know, demographic shift as people are becoming more and more overweight and big trend towards type 2 diabetes, even in adolescents. And so there is possibility for room to grow for this procedure, because I, I think a lot of people don't know that it is safe, so safe. Yes, and that's the unfortunate part of it is that um, for every one or two patients that undergoes bariatric surgery, there's about 98 or so out there who qualify and could benefit from it, but don't receive it. So we only reach, as bariatric surgeons, we reach about 1 or 2 percent of potential candidates who have excess weight, who have the medical problems that go with that, uh, and just are not made, made aware uh, in, in a lot of times of their options. So I, in my own practice, I've had patients who have undergone this, and the change has been um, miraculous seeing the metabolic changes, that they're no longer diabetic and their hemoglobin A1C is 6. And they also change, their whole appearance changes. They're no longer 
overweight. They can now bend and touch their toes. They can do climb the stairs, simple things which they had issues with doing. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about that. What, when people see you, what are their major complaints? What? So I, I, I believe in, in really putting patient uh, out in, at, at the center of this process. I really think that knowing their goals is really a good starting point and keeping an eye on that goal throughout the journey is very important. So I always ask patients, what do you want out of this procedure? And a lot of times I'm touched by how simple some answers are. We as physicians think the answers should be, you know, I want to get my A1C level to a 6 or get my blood pressure under 110. But a lot of times it's all about quality of life. I want to be able to play with my grandchildren or bend and tie my shoelace or fit in a um, regular seat at, in, in, a, in an airplane. Um, and those are very um, important outcomes, important goals that we as physicians should keep in mind. And I'm really happy when I see my patients uh, and, and hear how we've been able to achieve a um, majority of those uh, goals, um, it explains why they're so happy. Now, part of the success rate over the years is that the instrumentation has improved. I'm sure the laparoscopes in your training 10 years ago are different now. Yes. Tell us, uh, have they become smaller? Are the cameras better? Yes, so what we do in, in the field of minimally invasive surgery is, uh, in a way, it's like playing video games all day long. It's really a fun field in surgery. We use a lot of technology. We use, uh, as you alluded to, we use cameras that capture images and project on a high-definition screen uh, with magnification. So we have a typically a three, or three to four-fold magnification on a high-definition screen, so we can literally see every vessel, every structure, uh, in ways that sometimes it's really difficult to see uh, through an open approach with organs uh, on top of each other. Um, the instrumentation that we use is also a lot more advanced. Uh, the uh, sleeve gastrectomy is done via essentially a staple line. You can staple across the stomach with permanent titanium uh, staples. You can think about them like the sewing of a jacket, very fine, three rows, and uh, they've come a long way. We used to have um, staple lines that were two rows. They would bleed. They would have issues down, you know, afterwards, but they are very strong, very reliable, and uh, we don't really think twice about using them or wonder if they work. I like the video where you showed me where you invert the suture line. Yes. So the suture line is on the inside of the stomach, so that all the other organs never rub yes. on the suture line. So there are lots of things you don't see in this drawing, but as we create a sleeve, uh, we have the staple line that goes uh, this way, and everything else is one's own tissue. Um, this has to heal, and that's why we don't feed patients right away. But there's definitely a need for us to um, make sure that there's no adverse event. And so by placing some strategic sutures along the staple line, uh, many of us uh, feel that we are helping the healing process and avoiding issues like you point out. So we place certain sutures in the top portion to make sure that the staple line is inverted uh, to strengthen that area. And very important sutures to what we call PEXI or fix the sleeve in place so that as soon as you start eating the um, waves of muscle contraction that push the food through, don't incidentally create a pretzel out of the sleeve. And so we'd like that uh, the anatomy to stay as such. Oh, now, let's say I am 300 pounds overweight. Yes. So we're talking about a, maybe a 600 pound man or a woman, something like that. Using the five instruments is very good because you don't have to worry about wound dehiscence, a big scar, just doing that small thing. But I'm sure for people who have this much weight loss, this is still successful. But tell us what are some things that are worrisome versus losing only 100 pounds versus 300 pounds. So um, there are a, a number of issues that we pay attention to. As you lose weight in the first 6 to 12 months, you are, slightly, you are at increased risk of developing gallstones, for example. We know rapid weight loss can induce that. But fortunately, in modern medicine, research studies are cons constantly being performed. So about a decade or two ago, we identified a medication 
that helps reduce the incidence of developing gallstones from about 30% down to about 2 or 3%. So we place patients on a medication during that period so we don't have to worry about gallstones. As you lose weight, majority of changes are positive changes. We talk about improvements in musculoskeletal aches and pains, improve energy, yeah, and of course resolution of diabetes and other medical problems. There's this other psychological event that's occurring in patients that we sometimes as physicians take it for granted to be always positive because they're losing weight and health's improving, but an individual who's lived at 600 pounds is used to that psychology of being at that weight. And so we really have to be cognizant of the fact that there are stresses uh, along the journey as they lose the weight. They may require additional help to cope with these changes and re-identify themselves as someone who is much lighter. So there's a mental health aspect. That, a big one, yeah. yes. And I know that there are specialized bariatric nurses to help you with that. Um, we're getting near the end of the show. Let's sum up. I think for the take-home message for gastric sleeve is that, number one, it's safe that it is the uh, complication 0.1%, the same as a gallbladder, much improved from 50 years ago, um, and that insurance will cover it, and that there's a long period of counseling with your internal medicine doctor, uh, with mental health, with your bariatric surgeon, and there are five small incisions, very about half an inch, and see Dr. Mark Zare's website where there's, there are videos and also there are other videos. So thank you so much for having, you know, explaining all this and being on our show. And for our home audience, if you like the show, donate to KSAR Television and, you know, give us a Facebook like and visit Dr. Zare's website. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you.